This is a numerical experiment looking at triggering necking artificially. Necking is a phenomenon that is very common with different kinds of materials. Some materials will neck, some would not neck. But the question is, is it possible to trigger necking for materials that normally would not neck? What is the principle behind necking? How can we actually activate necking for different types of materials? This is the aim of this video. Sit back and relax as we get started with this modeling. As we start, it makes sense for us to look at the theory behind necking because we really need to understand what is necking all about so that we can design experiments that will explore what is really happening when a material is undergoing necking. So the first thing to look at is what really is necking? What is the definition of necking? And I provided a definition here. We said that necking is a visible decrease in cross-sectional area during a tensile deformation. It has to be a tensile deformation. And there is a decrease in cross-sectional area. And this occurs mainly when large strains begin to localize disproportionately within a small region within the material that you're testing. So if these features are evident, you're doing a tensile test, there is a region where there's a significant buildup of strains, and that strain leads to localization and reduction in cross-sectional area, that is necking. Now, this is a good example of a necking specimen. This is something that I picked up in this publication published by Argon, which is quite a famous guy in the field. And 1996 was when it was published. So basically, this material is a crystalline single phase crystalline material, a metallic material. And what you see right away here is a necking. So there's a reduction in cross section area and eventual fracture of these materials. So the question is, why does this happen? And when it happens, what can we do? Can we trigger this numerically? Now, what triggers necking? So if you're trying to understand what is really triggering necking, because if we're going to design the experiment, we need to understand what is triggering this necking so that we can recreate that within our experiment. So let's explore this a little bit more. The first feature is that there has to be an instability within the material that you're trying to test. Something has to be unstable in the way the material is behaving. And we're going to explore what that instability really is all about. And then the second thing is that there has to be a decrease in cross-sectional area, which would be normally greater than any strain happening that you're seeing within the material. And there is always this interplay between these two materials. And when the cross-sectional area is smaller and strain happening is bigger, then you can see necking happening. The next question is a concept which is called the considerate criterion. And this was something that was invented many years ago by this man, a civil engineer in France called Armand Considere. So he was working with different kind of materials and established that for the same materials that he was using, there was something that was happening that led to the presence of necking. And so he started establishing certain criterion which would be essential for necking to propagate or to initiate. And the first of his criterion says that all materials naturally have flaws in them. And so the main reason why necking happens is because of the presence of a flaw. And that flaw could also be in form of local changes in cross-section, which therefore will activate necking. So that's the first criterion that Amand came up with. The second one is that at yield, the cross-sectional area decreases so due to an incompressibility of plastic flow within the material. So he established that this necking has to occur somewhere around yield. So without the material yielding, you wouldn't see the presence of necking. And then the third criteria that now in the post yield behavior, three things can happen. You can see a strain softening or a plateau stress or even a strain hardening. Depending on the interplay of these three, necking can also form. And that was the other idea that Considere came up with. So what is the implication of this? The implication for us trying to design experiments to explore this is the fact that the extent of strain hardening is often less than the decrease in cross-sectional area. So to look and put some mathematics around this, so practically necking occurs when increase in local strain at a region is not matched by a corresponding increase in force in that region or a corresponding strain happening in that region. And so basically what that happens is that when necking begins to form, you find that the change of force in the material gets infinitesimally small because there is really no significant change in stress in that material. So mathematically, you can say the change in force at the onset of stress of necking tends to zero. And if you go ahead and do some derivation, basically you arrive at this formulation that the true stress within the material has to be equal to the slope of the change in true stress with change in true strain. So this criteria is the considered criterion that means that necking would happen in such material. So what we see here is that the true stress at a point will be equal to the change of 
through stress with respect to strain. And making a course, if this slope of two stress to strain graph equals the true stress value. And let's illustrate this graphically. So this is a, an axis and we have a normal stress strain diagram. And then if we convert it to a true strain diagram, we have something like this. So there's an, an increase in this in the stress value due to this true stress value. Now, if we plot on top of this graph, the change of true stress with true strain, okay, which is basically a slope, then you find that there is a point of intersection between the true stress and this change, this slope, and that point is the point where necking will occur. So on the two stress plot, it will occur here, on the normal stress will occur a little bit later. But the key critical point is that we are looking at this point. So at a strain of about 15%, necking would initiate in this material. So if we're going to explore the necking response, what we are going to be looking out for is plotting the true stress and comparing it with the slope of d, d sigma t and the epsilon t. So if we take all that information, for us to trigger necking within a material artificially, two things have to be in place. The first one, that there has to be a presence of a geometric flaw, which could be in the form of a notch, and there has to be less or minimal strain hardening within the material. So that's what consider it came up with, and that's the theory, and we want to see, does this actually work? Can we explore this numerically? Does it make sense when we look at this? And that's what we're going to do. Let's go into Abacus and begin to set up this different experiment. If you like this kind of video, please do subscribe to this channel. So when contents like this are made, you'll be the first to see it. And please, do you have issues around necking? How can I help you with understanding necking more? And what kind of videos around this area that you think will be useful for you? Do leave a comment in the comment section of this video. I'll be happy to make those videos. So here we are in Abacus and basically we are using this cylindrical dog bone tensile specimen to illustrate what is happening. If you want to see how this specimen is designed and all the issues around it, please look on this card here where I've shown how this specimen is designed. So let's look more closely on what we have here. So it's a dog bone cylindrical specimen and everything is there. So we've got all the mesh. The mesh has been generated and we are looking at the gauge section. The gauge section is fine. Everything is perfect in this situation. So what we then need to look at next is the material. So the first material will be a strain hardening material. So this is a material taken from this textbook of mine, which I published a few years ago. So if you look at page 380, it will give you the properties of this material. So basically, it's sort of a steel, mat steel material with a Young's model of 210 gigapascal and 0.33. And under the plastic regime, it's modeled by a Johnson Cook material model. And the Johnson Cook material model has a strain hardening associated with it. So the strain continues to rise up consistently. So this is the first experiment. So basically what we have here is a dog bone specimen with strain hardening. And we are also exploring the gauge section. So we are trying to track the stress and strain in the gauge section for this first case. And then how is the load applied? So at the front end, you've got a displacement and at the back end is fixed. So this is the very first experiment. So look at the results. So what we see here is no necking seen in the sample. So this is the very first experiment. So we have strain hardening, but no flaw in the material. Remember two requirements for necking to happen is that there has to be minimal strain hardening and flaw. So in this case, there is no strain softening. So the material just continues to harden and also Secondly, there is no flaw in the material, so we don't expect to see necking in this material. So let's look at the second experiment. And I've already set up the second experiment. And basically what we have here is the second experiment here says there's no flaw in the specimen, and but it has an elastoplastic material model, which means there is a build up of stress onto yield and then after yield the material stays constant. So there is neither a strain hardening or a strain softening. And remember for necking to occur, we'll expect that there will be some compromise on strain hardening in the material compared to the increasing strain in the material. So in this instance, so let's see what would happen. So how do we do that? So the only thing we need to add here is the strain the elastoplastic material model. So basically, it's got the same elastic properties, but under plasticity, you have just the yield stress and a single strain. So it gets to 305 and then stays constant to the end. So this is an elastoplastic model. So again, we apply the material model, run the simulation, go to the end and look at, and then we look at the result. So the result here shows, again, there is no necking in the material because there is no flaw and there is no compromise on strain hardening or strain softening. Two requirements for you to see necking occur in a material like this. So let's look at the third scenario. So the third scenario, what we're going to do with this third scenario 
third experiment is now we're going to introduce a material that show a significant strain softening a significant strain softening so that means there's a reduction in stress in the material as the strain continues to increase and this is one of the requirements for you to see necking occur in a material so how do we achieve that so again we get to the material i've included a third component here which is a strain softening material so on the plastic region so it starts at 305 but with increasing plastic strain the strain softens onto your somewhere around 100 megapascal this is a requirement for necking to occur in a material like this so what we're going to do is to look at the results from this third case where you're looking at strain softening in the material so instantly you see that there is evidence of necking in the material now this is because there is a strain softening in the material but even though there is no flaw in this material and this is really important because the cri consider a criteria establishes that you have to have a flaw or you have some kind of strain softening as the stress is decreasing with increasing strength in the material then you should see a necking and this instantly is what we have proven with this third experiment so what we are going to then do is next is to introduce flaws into the material and how do we do that so basically if we go back to the top here so we're going to use the case where we say okay there is no flaw i'm going to make that experiment so i'll copy that and make it my experiment number four and now there will be a flaw however the strain hardening effect will be there what kind of flaw do we have so we'll go back all the way to the section sketch of this material and i'm just going to introduce a flaw of some kind so it will just be a little thing happening inside the sample here so let's just do that so let's say somewhere around there we'll just introduce a really tiny flaw in the material okay so that's a little kind of a, a trimming of of the edge of the material okay so we've got that so we just need to delete this and then we'll see what happens here so we delete there and then we we'll zoom in here okay so that looks all right so it makes connection there so we look at this other end makes connection there so this is fine so we've got a structure looking as we expect and then we we'll click done okay so we just need to reach and erect that so it does show so it does show that there is a little bit of a, um, a, a slight tiny deviation in the middle here which is fine so all we need to do next is okay so we need to to mesh that again so we mesh the system again so we've got all that and then the gauge section here so So we'll just introduce more meshes in the middle here okay and then we'll go ahead and mesh the domain so it looks it looks all right everything looks fine as we'll expect so we'll look at the set okay so we'll just look at do we have the gauge section so the gauge section will be in the middle region here okay so our gauge section is fine so we'll make sure we select it properly all right so now we can so we'll switch this to the first instance so we are going to copy so co copy object from the no floor okay let's say from this floor case to this particular case so to number four and the materials that we are copying are all three of them and the section we are copying are all the three sections and then we click apply yes to all okay so so now we can look for the strain hardening case so we are now modeling this material using the strain hardening case and everything looks correct the way it should be now the fourth case is a case where we're looking at there's a presence of a floor with strain hardening if we then look at the result from the fourth case for where strain hardening is involved so again there is really no no necking at all so there is really this region where it seems like there's a neck but there's no necking because there's no significant reduction in cross-section area rather well and this is because of the presence of strain hardening remember increasing strain hardening does not favor necking even when there is a flaw here increasing necking strain hardening does not favor necking so let's 
try a different case. So I've already set up experiment five where we're looking at a floor but with a plastic strain, elastoplastic material. So that means there's no strain happening. The post yield behavior is just constant as you carry on. So let's see what you will get from that result. So if you look at the result for this instance, now you see a necking because of the presence of the floor. So the floor is what is triggering the necking, even though we do not have any strain happening in the material. So it goes back to what Considera said initially, that the flaw and, st and decreasing strain hardening are two part principles that encourage necking to occur. And in this instance, we have no increase in strain hardening, no reduction in strain hardening, rather a plateau stress, but there's a presence of a flaw. And so we end up seeing a neck happen in this material. So in this case, we have a flaw and strain softening both principles both features that encourage necking to occur and so let's look at the result that you generate from that and again our results show that we have the presence of a neck in the materials because we've got a floor we also have strain softening within the material so what we're going to do is to bring all that together to just to get a matrix to try and give us an insight into what is happening and so this is the matrix of putting everything together so basically these are the experiments we ran and this is a necking status. So when there is no flaw and strain hardening exists, of course, according to considerate criterion, there will be no necking. Now, in the second instance, we've got no flaw, but there's elastoplasticity. So that means the posterior response is constant. So there's no strain hardening or strain softening. And so the, the features that drive necking is also not evident in that second experiment. And so the necking status was no. Now, when you have a flaw, but a strain softening, no flaw, but strain softening. So one of the features that trigger necking is here, which is a strain softening. And so we're not surprised that we saw strain softening. And so there's a, a necking in the material. Now, the last, the number four case is there is a presence of a flaw, which is basically a geometric inconsistency, but strain hardening. So the strain hardening is then suppressing the presence of a neck. So even though you have a flaw, there is still no neck and this is what happens in those materials where you don't see the presence of a neck at all so they may have flaws in them they may have defects in them yet they still don't neck because what's happening here is that the material has the strain hardening feature incorporated something like polypropylene or polyethylene they just continue to take load forever and ever and so that in that instance there is really no possibility of necking occurring in them because of the strain hardening in the material even though there may be a flaw so that's, we didn't see any necking there. Now we go to number five, fifth experiments here. So there's a flaw, but there's elastoplasticity. So there's no increment in strain in this instance. It's just a plateau stress. And so we, we're not surprised to see a neck. And then of course, the final instance, the two triggers that drive necking, the presence of a flaw and strain, strain softening, we end up with a yes. So there's a neck forming in the material. So what we see from this little experiment is that necking is really driven by the presence of a geometric flaw or a strain softening or plateau stress within the material. Once you see the strain softening or a plateau stress within the material, then you don't, you begin to see a neck. So in order to trigger a neck artificially, you have to tweak the material behavior if it's possible to make it to see strain softening or you introduce a geometric flaw within the material. And those are two features that drive necking within this material. If you're really interested in exploring a little bit more around the experiment of tensile testing, then please look at this, these two videos, which tell you a lot more around tensile testing of these materials. Thank you for your interest in this channel. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.